the recording. Oh, there it goes. Attend, O oh reader, our tale of wonder. Welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. We are reading more Dracula. Let's, uh, before we jump right in, not Smurf cosplay? I firm agree I am not going to Smurf cosplay. Listen, just because my skin is undertoned blue does not mean I can become Smurf on command. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, last time on Paper Cuts, we read a little bit of Dracula, but to be honest, other than some, like, fun little character details about Jonathan and, uh, Mina and Lily, uh, you didn't miss much. Uh, as a modern reader, you know, we know what vampires are, we know kind of the tropes that have been codified around the vampire and everything, uh, so we're very well aware of, you know, Dracula drinking blood and being, uh, generally very strange and sleeping in a coffin. So, uh, that's basically what we read about last time. Oh, also Dracula is a huge fan of England for some reason and has decided that it is a great idea to move into a castle outside London. And, uh, he was in the process of moving himself and all of his various belongings to said castle right outside London, which, uh, he, uh... What's the word I'm looking for? He acquired the services of Jonathan Harker's, like, realtor, lawyer thing. Uh, you know, his boss essentially said, Oh, uh, go deal with this guy. And uh, Dracula threw Jonathan's, like, parent company, that's not the right word, uh, bought, <laughs> bought this castle uh, right outside London. And then we immediately cut to uh, Jonathan's significant other question mark someone he hopes to court that's definite that's definitely for sure he he hopes to court them uh we switch to the point of view of several people in london uh shall we say and we were discussing the uh finer points of life as uh lily continues to worry about jonathan because uh he's sending letters that don't make sense because surprise Dracula made Jonathan, uh, make fake letters that made it seem like if he did not make it back to London that he just got eaten by wolves or something on the way back. Uh, okay. I think that brings us to chapter 7. Uh, a cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th August, pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent in Whitby. One greatest and suddenest storms on record uh, has just been experienced here, with the results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as, and, as was ever known, and uh, a great body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, uh, Robin Woods Bay, uh, Rig Mill, Brunswick, uh, States, and the various trips in the neighborhood of Whitby. The steamers, Emma and Scarborough, made trips up and down the coast, and, sorry, I keep losing my place, uh, made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. Great way for the author to not write about a country he doesn't know. Uh, after the setup, he moves to England. Yeah, that's a great way to not, like, work on Transylvania as a setting. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Dracula is, is, is secretly a Tiabu the whole time, and now he's moving to London, which I know how to write. Yay! <laughs> you know? Love that for him. You know what they say, write what you know, even if it makes no sense. Uh, the day was unusually fine until the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard and from that commanding eminence watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east call attention to a sudden show of mare's tails high in the sky to the northwest. Uh, camera and audio went off briefly. Uh, the audio should not have gone off. That's firmly disallowed. Uh, first and foremost. Uh, the camera I did do on purpose. I needed to clean my glasses because I forgot to do that. Oops. Radio, we back. It's true. Radio, we back. 
It's Say Sounds. Shout outs to Say Sounds. Uh, he's real cool. He's, he's been doing... You completely rebuilt that destroyed save file, by the way. I didn't say anything, but I was lurking during those streams. Uh, he's been running a, a viewerverse thing on uh, on a WWE game. I don't recall which one in particular, but one of the more recent ones. And uh, his save file got eaten by gremlins. And then he rebuilt it. <laughs> He's also a great composer, musician, and uh, you should hire him for your videos, games, and or stream things. But that's just my hot take. Anyway, <laughs> the book we were reading. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in a mild degree, which in barometrical language is ranked number two, light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, for who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the east cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly colored clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk toward the cliff, in an old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset color, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses, not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined in colossal silhouettes. On both 2K19 and 2K22, uh, no wonder you've been having such an adventure with it. Yeah, I've been lurking around. Uh, he makes great stuff. And I heartily suggest you turn you you tune into his stuff, uh, even if you're not normally really big on like you know uh, what's the best way I can describe this uh, showman's wrestling, I guess is the best way that's coming to mind. Even if you're not big on that kind of thing, uh, I would heartily suggest dropping by. He is real cool. Actually, come to think of it. I have a fancy new shout-out command. There we go. Now the whole now the whole internet knows what you're about. Or at least my little corner of it. Uh Colossal Silhouettes, that's where we were. Wait a minute. I'm going to scooch the computer forward so I'm not squinting. That seems kind of unpleasant. Okay, is the camera good? The camera's a little high. Dude, this is why I, I should have done this before stream. A, a thousand little things. Is this a Dracula book or the Dracula book? It is the Dracula book by Bram Stoker. Uh, the original. Uh, the public domain English class favorite, if you will. And uh, we have yet to see the cowboy. Spoilers, by the way. There's a cowboy. <laughs> Actually, we might have met the cowboy in an earlier scene, but I just might have glossed over it. <laughs> I don't know yet. Either way, we, we will be seeing more of the cowboy if he has shown up. And if, if he has not shown up, uh, stay tuned. There's a cowboy. He exists. He's from America. Anyway, now that I've gotten thoroughly distracted from the book, uh, the experience was not lost on the painter's and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will, ra will grace the RA and RI walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule, as they termed the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually bug the shore so closely, uh, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment, while she remained in sight, 
and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in the face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. It's very much like Metopia in a way, watching friends duking it out and cutscenes and stories ensue. Precisely. You're, you're, you are essentially building a narrative on the fly based on some very complicated random number generators. <laughs> To, to boil it down to its purest essence, uh, it's very satisfying to watch, especially if you, like, have a particular character you're rooting for. Of course, I always am rooting for my obnoxious glowy lad, uh, but also anyone else with the obnoxious glowing effect. I'm just like, yes, they can win, they can do the thing. Uh, There's a cowboy in Dracula, you've been missing out. You haven't been missing out, you haven't missed much. Of course he's from America. He is, he is from America. Uh, it, it is it is the late 1800s, like 1880s, 1890s. I, there is a specific year that Gariki has messaged me, but I don't remember it because my brain is made of Swiss cheese. But it is like peak cowboy era in America right now. Anyway. Shortly before 10 o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive and the silence was so marked that the bleeding of a sheep inland or the barking of a dog in town was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier, which, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which at the time seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White-crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the lathorns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbor. Have you ever seen the meme vid, Be the American that Japan thinks you are? Uh, I am so curious to see how aggressively stereotypical this American cowboy is. Because, like, all I know is he exists. <laughs> no, but I live it. <laughs> Good goof. And just the like, howdy! I'm from I'm from America. I love my six gun. You know, pretty much a collection of clips from anime and games with overtly American characters. You mean like Bandit Keith from Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> just like that. <laughs> oh man, that is that was my immediate reference there. Uh, Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising was an obvious choice. A good choice too. Nano machines, son. Uh, God, I love, I love Metal Gear Rising. It's so cheesy, but it, it is unabashedly cheesy, and it's very entertaining to watch. Very easily distracted from the book this evening, uh, either pure of Whitby Harbor, the wind roared like thunder and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet or clung with grim clasp to bide the iron stanch. It was found necessary to clear the entire piers from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of this time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren and their living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the race of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast, followed by such sudden peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. 
the sea running mountains high, threw skywards with each wave, mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat with a rag of sail, running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of inrushing mist swept, it, swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, uh, as when a fishing boat with, a gun, with gunwale under water rushed into the harbor, able by the guidance of the sheltering light to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. Yeah, these clouds are pretty bad. <laughs> so I was waiting for someone in chat to notice that. <laughs> anyway. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on the shore, a shout for which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was then swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner, with all sails set, apparently, the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had, by this time, back to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she could fetch the entrance of the harbor. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, all sails set, was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old salt, it must fetch up somewhere if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog greater than any hitherto, a mass, to, a mass of dank mist which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing for the roar of the tempest, and the crash of the thunder, and the booming of the mighty billows that came through the damp of oblivion even louder than before. Real talk, though, I love how descriptive Stoker is. That is something that a lot of the books around here excel in. Uh, sometimes the author just just picks up the they just like they just decide oh this chapter has no dialogue i'm going to describe this scene for an entire chapter and it's so good and it's it it's something that comes across in my own writing a little bit sometimes i'm like i do not want to write dialogue time to aggressively describe this <laughs> and occasionally in interject with the inner monologue of a character <laughs> anyway uh um, were we organ of hearing uh, ah the rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbor mouth across the east pier where the shock was expected and men waited breathless the winds shifted suddenly to the northeast and the remnants of the sea fog melted in the blast then mirabile dictu between the piers leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed swept the strange schooner before the blast with all sail set and gained the safety of the harbor. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse with its drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on by all, as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel, washed by many tides and many storms, into the southeast corner of the pier, jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. In Scarlet Pimpernel, this half of one chapter, just about how this one person is dressed. Ooh, enjoy dinner, say it sounds. Also, on the topic of Scarlet Pimpernel, uh, several of the other Codex members have read Scarlet Pimpernel, so I'm cooling my heels on that one, even though I'm 
really in like a superhero uh masked hero mood and i really would love to read scarlet pimpernel i don't want to step on anybody else's toes uh you know i uh i, I want to give that one a little time to air out <laughs> so that i'm not reading the same thing as the rest of the codex because you know there's a lot of cross audience between uh codex members speaking of codex uh now that i've mentioned it it is a group of reading streamers just like me well not just like me we're all we're, we're all reading aloud that's the important bit uh we all read various uh public domain novels i think one of us still gets author permission for more modern things i'm not sure if that's a thing well either way uh she's been very busy as as of late and has not been streaming uh but anyway i digress uh we're all reading streamers and we all uh kind of cross-pollinate our audiences as much as possible uh, we also have a book club coming up. Oh, good heavens. It's the 27th. That's tomorrow. Uh, the book club is tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be talking about... What are we going to be talking about? I forgot for a second. Uh, uh, Flowers for Algernon. Uh, I read the short story because that's what I had time for. And <laughs> it sounds like several other people also had time for uh, time for the short story, but also most of the novel. Either way, I'm very excited to discuss this, uh, you know, it, it is by and large a classic. Uh, that, that's one thing, is the book club in uh, being discussion of a book, it is not always the standard public domain fare that we read aloud. That being said, I think you can find Flowers for Algernon pretty widely, at least the short story. But that's Codex in a nutshell. Uh, we're all read streamers. Uh, let me post the codex command so you can come join us. Boop. There we go. Alright, that's my spiel. Uh, we just left off at uh, Tate Hill Pier, I believe. Shout out to Tate, by the way. I hope he's doing well. I should talk to him more. Anyway. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and, running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to that east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrufsteens, or through stones, as they call them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away, uh, it disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the search. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as were all those, as all those whose houses were in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus, the coast guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who had once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it and recoiled at once as if under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It's a good way round from the West Cliff by a drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, and but by your correspond but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and I came well ahead of the crowd. When I had arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a, a crowd. I don't know why that stuck in my throat. Let's try that again. I found already a, oh, excuse me. Goodness gracious, the sentence very angry tonight. I found very I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, whom the Coast Guard and the police refused to allow to come on board. By courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, 
and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared, after making examination, the man must have been dead for two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the law. The Coast Guard said that the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was first on board may save some complications later on in the Admiralty Court. In the Admiralty Court. For Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mortman, since the tiller, as emblem ship, if not proof of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman had been reverently removed from the place where he held his honorable watch and ward till death. A steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Oh, excuse me. Crowds are scattering homeward. The sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire voids, or wolds, rather. I shall send, in time, for your next issue, further details of the derelict ship which found her way so miraculously into harbor in the storm. From Whitby, in on the 9th of August. Before I start in on this, uh, we are reading this in linear or We are reading this in published order uh the dracula daily folks will not have seen will not see these entries until well august three months from now so they are experiencing the uh they are experiencing the whole of the book completely differently they are experiencing it in chronological order based on the dates that are appended to things uh which is wild crazy super different uh and i was so tempted to sign up for it if it would not have spoiled my reading for this after i'm done reading this i'm absolutely signing up for it because that sounds neat but that's actually the impetus behind why i was reading this anyway where was i ah whitby 9th august the sequel to that strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She's filled almost entirely in ballast of silver sand, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. This cargo was consigned to a would-be solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington of Seventh the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days' wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of after complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tr tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way onto the moors, where it's still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should in itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning, a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Hill Pier, 
was found dead in the roadway opposite to its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly it had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away and its belly was slit open as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the board of the trade inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to the facts of the missing man. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and a strange narrative between the two of them has unfolded. It has not been my luck to Okay, I completely whipped that sentence. Uh, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold that has not been my lot to come across. See, I read that backwards. I I read that uh, as I've I've never found a more strange narrative than this, and it has never been my lot to come across it type thing. Uh, but anyway, as there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It seems, it almost seems, as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly, who kindly translated for me, time being short. The log of the Demeter. Varna to Whitby. Written 18th July, things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth until we land. On 6th July, we had, we finished taking in cargo, silver sand, and boxes of earth. At noon, set sail. East wind, fresh crew, five hands, two mates, cook, and myself. On 11th July, at dawn, entered Bosphorus, boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish, all correct, underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Dardanelles, more customs officers and flag boat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again, work of officers thorough but quick, want us off soon. At dark, past and dark Pelagon. On, on 13th July, past Cape Matapan, crew dissatisfied about something, seemed scared but would not speak out. On 14 July, was somewhat anxious about crew. Men, all steady fellows who sailed with me before, mate could not make out what was wrong. He, they only told him there was something and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, mate reported in the morning that one of crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Couldn't account for it. Took larboard watch, ate bells last night, was relieved by Abramoff, but did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, old Guaran, came to my cabin, and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch there had been, he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm, and he saw a tall, thin man who was not like any of the crew come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to bows, found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I'm afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search the entire ship carefully, from stern to stern, or stem to stern, rather. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men, said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a hand spike. I let him take the helm, while the rest began thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men so much relieved when the search was over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 
22nd July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread, made cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for good work in bad weather. Pre past Gibraltar, Gibraltar, out through the straits. All well. 24th July. There seems some doom over the ship. Already a hand short, and entering on the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead. And yet last night another man lost. Disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men, in all the panic of fear, sent around Robin, asking to have double watch, as they fear to be alone. Mate angry. Fear, will the, fear there will be some trouble, as either he or the men will do some violence. 28th July. Four days in hell, knocking about in some sort of maelstrom, and the wind and tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all sworn out. Hardly know how to set a watch since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, and feel them less as the ship is steadier. 29th June. Another tragedy. Had, it, had single watch tonight, as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised out fry, and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate, and the crew is in panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth, and wait for any sign of cause. Last night, rejoiced as we near England. Weather fine, all sails, sails set. Retired, worn out. Slept soundly, awakened by mate telling me that both men of watch and steers been missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. First August. Two days of fog, and not a sail sighted. Had hoped, when in the English Channel, to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as we could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of the men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently, with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he remaining. 2nd August, midnight. Woke up from a few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in the fog. Rushed on deck and ran, ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. Gone. Who would help us? Mate says we must be past the Straits of Dover, as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If we are, if so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog, which seemed to move with us. God seems to have deserted us. Third August. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, and so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed, haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. I watched last night. I saw it. Like a man. Tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife. And the knife went through it empty as the air. And as he spoke, he took his knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on. But it is here. And I'll find it. It is in the hole. Perhaps in one of those boxes. I will screw them one by one you s and see. You work the hell. And with a warning look, a finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern and go down the forward hatchway. He's mad, stark raving mad, and it's no use in my trying to stop him. 
We can't hurt those big boxes. They're in voice as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay, mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by and signal. Sorry, I'm um, horrible place to cut off, but I need to double check my lighting here. How's this? Does it look okay? I look a little red in the face. But I honestly I am a little red in the face. It's kinda of hot here. So we'll take those. Uh it is nearly all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream, which made my blood run cold, and upon the deck he came, as if shot from a gun. A raging madman, with his eyes rolled, his face convulsed with fear. Save me! Save me! He cried, and then looked round on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You better come too, Captain, before it's too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. That's all that's left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too. Or I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who got rid of the men one by one. And now he has followed them and set himself. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port? Will that ever be? 4th August. Still fog which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I'm a sailor. I else I know not. I dared not to go below. I dared not to leave the helm. So here all night I stayed. And in the dimness of night I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water. No man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for when I tie my hands to the wheel, and my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as a captain. I'm growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, well, then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God, and the Blessed Virgin, and the Saints, help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open. There's no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there's now none to say. The folk here almost universally hold that the captain is simply a hero, he's to be given a public funeral. Already is arranged that his body is to be taken, the train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much warning. For public opinion in its rest present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, and so will end this one more mystery of the sea. And now finally we come back to Mina Murray's journal, rather than the, uh, Newspaper clipping that we've been reading. 8th August. Lucy was very restless all night, and I, too, could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy didn't wake, but she got... Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her back to bed. It's a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, 
for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning, we both got up and went down to the harbor to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright, the air clear and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow. Forcing themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbor like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night, but on land. But oh, is, is he on land or sea? Where is he and how? I'm getting fearfully anxious about it. If I, if I only knew what to do and could do anything. 10th August. The funeral of this poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbor seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She's quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck having been broken. He had, evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dead old man! Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, then harshly, then angrily, but it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a sort of fury, with its eyes savage, and all its hairs bristling out like a cat's tail when it's, when it's on the warpath. Finally, the man, too, got angry, and jumped down and kicked dog, took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged, half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor, pit, the poor thing became quiet, and fell into all the tremor. It did not try to get away, it crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity, too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog looking at it in an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is of too supersensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I'm sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will all afford material for her dream. I am thirsty tonight. We are scarce an hour into this, and I'm already out of water. Oh boy. I think this desert attitude is getting to me a bit. Which, spoilers, I am currently in a desert uh, area. No points for guessing. But this dry air, I am but a simple Midwestern lad. I am 
far too used to my summers being absurdly humid. Comparison to this practically rarefied desert air in comparison. <laughs> So you'll have to excuse me if I'm drink if I seem to be taking a lot of breaks for water in comparison. But that's just how it goes, you know. Sometimes I'm in a place that does not have a lot of humidity, and you know, you you lose an incredible volume of water from your mouth as you are speaking, as we have all become intimately aware with uh, over the past few years. So, you know, talking this much already makes me kind of thirsty, and doing it in the desert is doing me no favors. Uh, off of material for her dreams, I believe, is where we were. I think it will be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin's Ho Robin Hood's Bay, back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking, then. Oh, well, if I'd have known it was just going to be three sentences, I would have waited to get my water between chapters, because we're about to start another one. Also, the boys are both asleep, so I probably will not need the snowballs this evening, but it's nice to have one around in case problems decide to arise. For context, these are like soft fabric balls. They're like kind of, they're essentially just like a little, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's just like a little ball of like wool, I guess. It's, it's a little ball of fiber. I will not claim that these are wool. But they're like, it's a little ball of fiber that's been like loosely bound in the middle and just kind of lets it outward. It kind of floof outward and it's kind of been squished down into a little ball. I promise these are soft. If you ever see me throw one at Magnus for being a bad boy, these are very soft, and I'm throwing them to startle him and nothing more. I want to make that abundantly clear. Probably make that a chat command. <laughs> anyway. Let's grab one more drink of water. Chapter 8, again in Mina Murray's journal. The same day at 11 o'clock p.m. <sighs> Tired. If it were not that I had made my diary a duty, I should not open it tonight. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits, owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse and frightened the wits out of us. I believe we forgot everything except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital severe tea at Robin Hood's Bay in a sweet little old-fashioned inn, and with a bow, with a bow window, with a bow window, bow window, right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather many, stoppages to rest, and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired, and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westenra uh, asked him to stay for supper. Lucy and I both had a fight for it with the dusty miller, uh, I know, it was a hard fight on my part, and I'm quite heroic that I think some day the bishops must get together and see about breeding up a new class of curates who don't take supper, no matter how they be pressed to, and who will know when the girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more color in her cheeks than usual and looks oh so sweet. If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with, her, with seeing her, only in the drawing room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new women writers will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing or accepting. But I suppose the new woman won't condescend in the future to accept. She will do the proposing herself. 
and a nice job she will make of it too. There's some consolation in that. I'm so happy tonight because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner. But we are over her troubles with dreaming. I should be quite happy if only I knew if Jonathan... Well, God bless and keep him. Also, fun fact that I did not know until the other day. The drawing room is short for the withdrawing room, where you withdraw from, like, polite company to, like, be emotional and or secretive about things. Which... Uh, talk about social conventions that need to come back is the ability to, like, politely withdraw from a situation. Like, oh, something has come up. I need to, you know, handle this for a minute. Like, go take a phone call in the other room, essentially. Uh, that, that, uh... That needs to come back. Like, I guess it kind of does already. It's like, oh man, everybody's in the living room playing board games. Uh, oh no, important phone call. Let me go take this to the kitchen so you all don't have to hear it, kind of thing. But, just, I, I, I had been reading novels that had been mentioning the drawing room so much, and I'm like, well, I guess, like, art was kind of one of the expected hobbies of a proper... Uh, both a proper woman and a proper man, you know, at the time. So I guess they do a lot of drawing. No. Bonk. It's the withdrawing room where you withdraw from polite company. Like, uh, for years my assumption had been, oh, yeah, the drawing room where they're drawing. And, like, you know, there is a sense of intimacy there because it is the artist and whoever is acting as their figure model or, the, or their muse. So that's why all these intimate scenes happen there. Nope. <laughs> it's the withdrawing room. Anyway. That, look, that looks bad. I don't like that. Okay. Anyway. Where was I? Uh, 11th August, 3 a.m. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I'm too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Then suddenly I became broad awake, and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me, and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found that she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who has been more ill than usual lately, uh, so threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. <laughs> I need you to sketch it. <laughs> prithee, prithee, destroy the parchment. Unless. Nay, nay, destroy it. Unless. The parchment, my lady. Anyway. <laughs> oh, man, that's a good bit. I, I missed doing that bit. Uh, mm, I feared to wake her mother. As I was leaving the room, it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue as to her dreaming intention. Dressing gown would be house. Dress outside. Dressing gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself. She cannot be far as she's only in her nightdress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in the other open rooms of the house with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally, I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the catch of the lock had not been caught. The people of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all the details. I took a big heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier, I looked across the harbour to the east cliff in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in her favourite seat. It was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds, which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing, as the shadow of a cloud obscured St. Mary's Church and all around. 
Then, as the cloud passed, I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view. In the edge of a narrow band, light, sharp as a sword cut, moved along. The church and the churchyard became gravi gradually visible. The church and the churchyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favorite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. But the coming out of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadow shut down on light almost immediately. But it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I didn't wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish pond to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced, uh, I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. Time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled, my breath became labored as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. It, I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint of my body were rusty. <laughs> Doesn't that sound familiar? When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat of the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something long and black bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy! Lucy! And something raised the head, and from where I saw, I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so, I lost sight of her. You guys can't see library very well. Oh, well. Uh, when I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining, with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, uh, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full in every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep, and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her throat. While she did so, there came a little shudder through her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her, and drew the edges tight round her neck, or, for I dreaded lest she could get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all, all at once, so, in order to have my hands free that I might help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety, and pinched or pricked her with it, for by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again, and groaned. When was the safety pin invented? I'm sorry. Like, that just rolled over in my brain. Like, clearly they have safety pins by this time. But when was the safety pin invented? When was the safety pin invented? Google says 1849. So they've existed for a good 40-ish years by this point. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about that. I'm like, well, somebody just... Uh, the first chapter, someone mentioned a Kodak camera, and, like, someone was using a typewriter, and it was a big deal, so clearly they have safety pins, but I, I was just curious how long those had existed. Because as I was reading that sentence, I was it, they were about to mention, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna pin this shawl around her. I was expecting, like, you, you know one of those penannular brooches? It's kind of like a, it's like an omega-looking shape, and then it has, like, a pin... Uh, attached to it on one end and then like you essentially you run the pin through some volume of the fabric of a blanket and then rotate the pin to hit one of the sides of the omega to uh to like force all that fabric to bunch and uh and hold hold it still as a cloak would Which might I add, something I've been very tempted to purchase. 
and then just buy like a small bolt of like long enough for the first safety pins to have tetanus. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, though. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, I was I was thinking about getting one of those penangular brooches and then, like, just getting, like, a bolt of, like, thin-ish white fabric to just kind of, like, get the sun off my back a little bit. Because I wear a lot of dark collars, and so going out in the sun with dark collars and skin this fair, like... So fair. My my skin is so pale that uh, I was trying to like, I was trying to send a picture of my monster of the week notes the other day and Discord like I was holding the notes up to the camera, and uh, Discord said that's a not safe for work photo. You don't get to send that. I'm like it's a book, <laughs> but my skin is the same like so pale as to blend into some more. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, more toned, un more unbleached paper. Uh, my skin will blend in very easily to it, especially if you're really compressing the picture down. So uh, going out in the sun does not end well for me. Uh, and because I am very forgetful about sunscreen, somehow with skin this pale, no points for guessing how, uh, my thought is if I get like some thin white fabric to cover myself, uh, it'll be white, so it won't attract as much heat as my dark clothing, and it will act as some kind of impromptu sunscreen. And hopefully, if it is thin enough, it will not, you know, trap a ton of heat as a good cloak should. But, I digress a great deal. Uh, we got distracted by safety pins. Uh, she put her hand up to her throat and groaned. That's where we were. When I, had her, when I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet and then began very gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. Uh, little context, sorry. I know I've just aside twice in a row, but a little context. Uh, at this time, it was considered very bad to awaken a sleepwalker abruptly. There was something about there was some thought about the conscious and unconscious interacting in such a way while someone is sleepwalking that to awaken them would startle them greatly uh, enough that people of a weaker constitution would die. Uh, so that's why, that's probably why they're like, yeah, I need to wake her slowly. I mean, still, it's probably not the best thing to awaken a sleepwalker just in the sense of they are in a lower state of consciousness, but it's not going to damage them, it's just going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> really, what you're best off to do is if you catch someone sleepwalking is kind of just gently guide them back to bed. They usually will stay down. Uh, <laughs> as if I have much experience being the conscious one in that scenario. Anyway. <laughs> but that's, that's the thought here, is they don't want to awaken the sleepwalking uh, the sleepwalking Lily too quickly in order to not provide her undue stress. Also, I should note I am not a neuroscientist. If there have been studies on whether it is a good idea to awaken or leave a sleepwalker sleeping, consult those. That's just what I remember. Anyway, now that I've covered my bases and gotten thoroughly, thoroughly distracted, book. Um, uh, running more easy, that's where we were. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once. I shook her more forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as, of course, she did not realize all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold, and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in the churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little, and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes, but I would not. 
However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that we went, so that as we went home, no one, in case we should meet anyone, should notice my bare feet. Fortune favored us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, passing along a street in front of us, but we hid in a door till he had disappeared up an opening, such as there are here. Steep little closes, or wines, as they call them in Scotland. Not pronouncing that right, if it's a Scottish term. Anyway, uh, my heart beats so loud all the time that sometimes I thought I should faint. I, sh I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and had washed our feet and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into her bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored, me not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and thinking, too, of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. The same day at noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her, and seemed not to have even changed her sigh. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her, on the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that any clumsiness with my... Rather, I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her. Indeed, it might have been serious, but the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it, for there are two little points like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood. When I apologized and was concerned about it, she laughed and patted me and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it cannot leave a scar as it is so tiny. The same day at night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear and the sun bright and there was a cool breeze. We took our lunch in Bulgrave Woods, Mrs. Wistenra driving by the road, and Lucy and I walking by the cliff path and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself for I could not but feel how absolutely happy it would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled on the casino terrace and heard some good music by Spore and Mackenzie and went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been for some time and, I fell, as and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the keys, same as before, though I do not expect any trouble tonight. I gotta check my water filter. This doesn't taste right. That or I need to wash my water bottle. Either way, 12th August. My expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was wakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient in finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke, I woke with dawn and heard the birds chirping outside of the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see, even better than on the previous morning. All her old gaiety of the manor seemed to have come back, and she came. Then she came and snuggled in beside me, and told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, and she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can help to make them more bearable. Thirteenth August, another quiet day, and to bed with the key on my wrist as before. Again, I woke in the night and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. It was brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky, merged together in one great silent mystery, was beautiful, beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, 
coming and going in great whirling circles. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbor towards the abbey. When I came back from the window, Lucy had laid down again and was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th August. On the East Cliff, reading and writing all day. Lucy seems to have become as much in love with the spot as I am, and it is hard to get her away from it when it's time to come home for lunch, or tea, or dinner. This afternoon she made a funny remark. We were coming home for dinner and come to the top of the steps, up from the west pier, and stopped to look at the view as we generally do. The setting sun, low down in the sky, was just dropping behind Kettleness. The red light was thrown over on the east cliff in the old abbey, and seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful, rosy glow. We were silent for a while, and suddenly Lucy murmured as if to herself, uh, herself, His red eyes, again, we're just the same. It was such an odd expression, coming apropos of nothing. It quite startled me. I slewed round a little so as to see Lucy without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was in a half-dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out. So I said nothing, but followed her eyes. She, she appeared to be looking over at our own seat, whereon was a dark figure, seated alone. I was a little startled myself, for it seemed, for an instant, as if the stranger had eyes like burning flames, but a second look dispelled that illusion. The red sunlight was shining on the windows of St. Mary's Church behind our seat, and as the sun dipped there, it was a sufficient change in refraction and reflection to make it appear as if the light moved. I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself from the start, but she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never referred to it, so I said nothing, and we went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache and went early to bed. I saw her asleep and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the westward and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, so bright that through the front of our part where the crest was in shadow, everything could be well, in, well seen. I threw a glance up at our window and saw Lucy's head leaning out. I thought perhaps that she was looking out for me, so I opened my handkerchief and waved it. She did not notice or make any movement whatsoever. Just then, the moonlight crept round an angle of the building, and a light fell on the window. There, distinctly, was Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window sill, and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep, and by her, seated on the window sill, was something that looked like a good-sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs. As I came into the room, she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat as though to protect it from cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. She looks so sweet as she sleeps, but she's paler than is her wont and there is a drawn, haggard look under her eyes which I do not like. I fear she's fretting about something. I wish I could find out what it was. 15th August. Rose later than you. Lucy was languid, tired, and slept on after we'd been called. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is full of quiet joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day, she told me the cause. She's grieved to lose Lucy as her very own, but she is rejoiced that she is soon to have someone to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady. She confided to me that she has got her death wound. She has not told Lucy, and made me promise secrecy. Her, her doctor told her that within a few months at most she must die, for her heart is weakening. At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. We were wise to keep her from the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleepwalking. 17th August. 
No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker, whilst her mother's hours are numbering to a close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she's doing. She eats well, and sleeps well, and enjoys the fresh air even, but all the time the roses in her cheeks are fading, and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I hear her gasping as if for air. I keep the key of our door always fastened to my wrist at night, but she gets up and walks about the room and sits at the open window. Last night I found her leaning out of it when, when I woke up. When I tried to wake her, I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her, she was weak as water and cried silently between long, painful strolls for breath. When I asked her how she came to be at the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep. The tiny wounds seemed not to have healed. They're still open, if anything, larger than before, and the edges of them are faintly white. They're like little white dots with red centers. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist upon the doctor seeing about them. A letter. Samuel F. Billington and Son, solicitors at Whitby, to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, on the 17th of August. Dear Sirs, herewith please receive invoice of goods sent by the Great Northern Railway. Son, same are be to be delivered at Carfax, near Purfleet, immediately on receipt of goods station King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but enclosed please find keys all of which are labeled. You will please deposit the boxes, 50 in number, which form the consignment, in the partially ruined building forming part of the house, and marked A on the rough diagram and close. Your agent will easily recognize the locality, as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. The goods leave by the train at 9.30 tonight, and will be due at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged by your having teams ready at King's Cross, the time named, forthwith conveying the goods to the destination. In order to, in order to obviate any delays possible through any routine requirements as the payment in your departments, we enclose check, we enclose check herewith for ten pounds, receipt of which please acknowledge. Should the change be less than this amount, or should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, we shall at once send check for difference on hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business courtesy, in pressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are, dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington, son. Another letter. Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, to Messrs. Billington and Son, with me. Dear sirs, uh, rather, 21st August. Dear sirs, we beg to acknowledge ten pounds received and to return check one pound seventeen shillings. Uh... Uh, I don't know what 9D is short for. Uh, 1 pound 17 shillings 9, uh, 9 decimal, perhaps? Something along that line. It's, it's, it's the next level of pound currency down from shillings that I don't remember because I've only had to deal with pounds while they're decimalized. Uh, anyway, a amount of overplus as shown in receipted account herewith. Goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions, and keys left in parcel in main hall as directed. We are, dear sirs, yours respectfully, Pro Carter, Patterson, and Co. Finally, we jump back to Mina Murray's journal, once again, 18th August. I'm happy today, and right sitting on the seat in the churchyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well, all night, and did not disturb me once. The roses seem to be coming back already in her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. 
If she were in any way anemic, I could understand it, but she's not. She's in gay spirits, full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid residents, residents, uh, all the morbid residents seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I needed any reminding, of that night that it was here on this very seat I found her asleep. As she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of her boot on the stone slab. Apologies, I needed to drink the water there. Uh, as she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of her boot on the stone slab and said, My poor little feet didn't make such noise then. I dare say poor old Mr. Swales would have told me it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie. As she was in such a communicative humor, I asked if she dreamed at all that night. Before she answered, that sweet, puckered look came into her forehead, which Arthur, I call him Arthur from her habit, says he loves. And indeed, I don't wonder that he does. Then she went on in a half-dreaming kind of way, as if trying to recall it to herself. I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. I only wanted to be here, in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something. I don't know what. I remember, though, I suppose. I was asleep, and uh, passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leapt as I went by, and I leaned over to look at it and heard a whole lot of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs howling at once as I went up the steps. Then I had a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes just as we saw in that sunset, and something sweet and very bitter all, ar all around me at once. And I seemed sinking into deep green water. There was a singing in my ears, as I've heard there is to drowning men. And everything seemed to be passing away from me. My soul seemed to go out from my body and float around the air. I seem to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me, there was a sort of agonizing feeling, as if I were in an earthquake. I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you. Then she began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to it. Her, I, I listened to her breath. Hi, Raz. Enjoy your lurk. Uh, by the way, Bariki has correctly pointed out uh, the volume rules have changed. You are allowed to be muted while you're lurking. But that doesn't do you much good with a stream like this, if you ask me. It's uh, it's another story if you are... Uh... Sorry, I'm... I just noticed something. Fix that. Uh, it's another story if, if I'm doing, you know, tabletop stuff or... To a lesser degree, even, uh, if I'm just doing, like, normal gameplay stuff, it's one thing, but, like, don't quite get why you would, why you would lurk muted, on um, paper cuts, but do feel free, you know? Just because it doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean you're not allowed. Anyway. <laughs> I'm very tempted to close one or several of my windows right now, but I'll wait. That'll, that'll, that'll happen in her mission. Uh, I listened to her quite breathlessly. That's where we were. I did not quite like it, and thought it better to not keep her mind on the subject, so we drifted on to other subjects, and Lucy was like her old self again. When we got home, the fresh breeze had braced her up, braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when we saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. Sorry, I keep turning on this light in hopes that it will backfill the lighting a little bit, but it just doesn't. Anyway, 19 August. Joy, 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 although not all joy. At last, news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill, that's why he didn't write. I'm not afraid to think it or say it now that I know. Mr. Hawkins sent me on the letter and wrote himself, oh, so kindly. I am to leave in the morning and go over to Jonathan, and to help to nurse him if necessary, and to bring him home. Mr. Hawkins said it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I've cried over the good sister's letter, 
until I can feel it wet against my bosom where it lies. It is of Jonathan, and must be my next and must be next my heart, for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out, and my luggage ready. I am only taking one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London, and keep it till I send for it, for it may be that uh, I must write no more. I must keep it to say to Jonathan, my husband. The letter that he has seen and touched must comfort me till we meet. A letter from Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, uh, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray. Ah, uh, that's why her name's Mina. I was like, that sounds like a very strange name, just out of context. It's Mina is short for Wilhelmina. Also, Wilhelmina, a name that I doubt a lot of people are using nowadays because of, you know, Wilhelm and his scream. I will say I am fond of the name Desdemona. I know it's long and it's overcomplicated, but it can be shortened to Des. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I feel a particular affinity to long, overdramatic names. Whether I will sa whether I will saddle a child with one of those is another story. I will saddle plenty of characters with them, but a whole child that remains to be seen, and that's a long time away. Anyway, uh, this letter, twelfth of August, dear madam, I write by desire of Mister Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, though progressing well, thanks to God and Saint Joseph and Saint Mary. He has been under our care for nearly six weeks suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love, and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say, with his dutiful respects, that he is sorry for his delay, and that all of his work is completed. He will require some few weeks' rest in our sanatorium in the hills, but will then return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him, and that he would like to pay for his staying here, so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, yours with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. Postscript, my patient being asleep, I open this to let you know something more. He has told me all about you, and you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to you both. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful of wolves, poison, blood of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Be careful with him always. There may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. The traces of such an illness as his do not lightly die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friends, and there was on him nothing that anyone could understand. He came in, he came in the train from Klausenburg, and the guard was told by the station master there but he rushed into the station, shouting for a ticket for, ho for home. Seeing from his violent demeanor that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the furthest station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured that he is well cared for. He has won all hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well, and I have no doubt will in a few weeks be all himself. But do be careful of him, for safety's sake. There are... Pray God and St. Joseph and St. Mary many, many happy years for you both. Ooh, now we cut over to Dr. Seward's diary to pay attention in the sanatorium a little bit. Uh, 19th August. Strange and sudden change in Renfield. Oh, this is the, uh, this is the wax cylinder guy. Let me, uh, stick on it then. 19th August. Sudden and strange change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock, he began to get excited, sniff about as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to the attendant, and at times servile, but tonight, the man tells me, he was quite haughty. would not consent to talk with him at all. All he would say was, I, I don't want to talk to you. You don't count now. The master is at hand. The attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out for squalls, for a strong man with homicidal and religious 
mania at once may be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. His attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant. In his sublime self-feeling, the difference between myself and attendant seemed to him as nothing. It looks like religious mania, but he will soon think that he himself is God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away. The real god taketh heed lest a sparrow fall, but the god created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow. Oh, if men only knew. For half an hour more, Renfield kept getting excited in greater and greater degree. I did not pretend to be watching him, but I kept strict observation all the same. All at once that shifty look came into his eyes which we always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head and back which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quiet and went and sat on the edge of his bed resignedly, and I looked into the space with lackluster eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed tried to lead him to talk of his pets, a theme which had never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said testily, Father Ma, I don't care a bit about them. What? You don't mean to tell me you don't care about your spiders. Spiders at present are his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this he answered enig enigmatically, The bright wings rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride, bride draweth nigh, then the maiden shine not to the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately, uh, obstinately seated on his bed all the time I remained with him. I am weary tonight, and low in spirits. I cannot but think of Lucy and how different things might have been. If I don't sleep at once, chloral, the modern Morpheus, C2HCL3OH2O. I must not. I must be careful not to let it grow into a habit. No, I shall take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy. I shall not dishonor her by mixing the two. If need be, tonight shall be sleepless. The cylinder runs out. He places another cylinder in the machine. Glad I made the resolution. Gladder still that I kept to it. I had lain crossing about, and heard the clock struck. The the clock. <sighs> Glad I had made the resolution, gladder that I had kept to it. I had lain tossing about, and had heard the clock strike only twice when the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward to say that Renfield has escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he had seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep on his bed, and he had looked through the observation trap at the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and had at once sent up for me. He was only in his night gear and cannot be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He's a bulky man, and couldn't get through the window. I'm thin, so with his aid, I got out, but feet foremost, and as we were only a few feet above the ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me that the patient had gone to the left, and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall, which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once, told the watchman to get three or four men immediately, and followed me onto the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently, to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him, and so ventured to draw nearer to him. 
the more so my, as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I heard him say, I am here to be betting master of your slave, and you shall reward me. For I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar, anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes, even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He's immensely strong, for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such, such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like this, he might have done wild work before his cage. He's safe now, at any rate. Jack Shepard himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I should be patient, Custer. It's coming. 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 So I took the hint and came too. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. And the cylinder runs out once more. I do hope I have enough spare time lying around when I get around to editing these in the near future uh, to try and figure out the right pass filtering to make those sound akin to a... Uh, to like a wax cylinder. I know wax cylinders have like a well-documented specific frequency range that works really well, so I could probably, even in Audacity, mask out everything but that frequency range to kind of give it that effect. It would also be just a nice effect to have in my back pocket, to be fair. But you know, wax cylinders are cool. It's like a weird... It's a weird grandfather of a vinyl record and like, people really care for vinyl records because of their obvious uh you know vinyl imperfections and so i don't know it's a thought whether i will manage to do that is entirely unclear although i do hope it does happen I i've been trying to put a lot of work into the podcast lately hence why i got so far behind on vods anyway uh chapter nine Letter, Mina Harper to Lucy Westenra, from Budapest, in 24th August. My dearest Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station in Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to Hall all right, and caught the boat to Hamburg, and then the train on here. I feel that I can hardly recall anything of the journey, except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan, and that, I sh and that as I should have to do some nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found, my dear one, oh, so thin, pale, weak-looking. All the resolution has gone out of his dear eyes, and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face has vanished. He is only a wreck of himself, and does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least he wants me to believe so, and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he raved of dreadful things whilst he was off his head. I wanted her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself and say she would never tell. That the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, that if a nurse through her vocation should hear them, she should respect her trust. She's a sweet, good soul, and the next day when she saw I was troubled, she opened up the subject again, and after saying that, she could, and after saying that she could never mention what my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he has done wrong himself, and you, as his wife-to-be, have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you or what he owes to you. His fear was of great, terrible things of which no mortal can treat. I do believe the dear soul thought I must be jealous that my 
lest my poor dear should have fallen in love with any other girl. The idea of my being jealous about Jonathan. And yet, my dear, let me whisper, I felt a thrill of joy through me when I knew that no other woman was the cause of trouble. For I am now sitting by his bedside, where I can see his face while he sleeps. He's waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat, as he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought all his things. I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew then that I might have some clue to his trouble. But I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window, saying he wanted to be quite alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and when I came, he had his hand over the notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina. I knew then that he was in deadly earnest, for he never called me by that name, since he has asked me to marry him. You know, my dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I've had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is, I feel my head spin round, and I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had the brain fever. That is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here, with our marriage. For, my dear, we had decided to be married as soon as the formalities had completed. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it, keep it, read it if you will, but never let me know, unless, indeed, some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back, exhausted. I put the book under his pillow and kissed him. I have asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and am waiting for a reply. She has come and told me the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour, and all was ready. He sat up in his bed, propped up with pillows. He answered his I will firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even those words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please, God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibilities I have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding friend. And the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband, First time I have written the words my husband, left me alone with my husband. I took the book from under his pillow and wrapped it up in white paper, and tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was round my neck, and sealed over the knot with the sealing wax, and for my seal I used my wedding ring. Then I kissed it and showed it to my husband, and told him that I would keep it so, that it would be an outward and visible sign for us, that all our lives we trusted each other for I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake, for the sake of some stern duty. And he took my hand in his, and oh, Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand, and said that it was the dearest thing in all the wide world. He would go through all the past again to win it, if need be. Poor dear meant to have said a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet. I shall not wonder if at first he mixes up not only the mouth, or the month, but also the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, that I had nothing to give him except myself, my life, and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And, my dear, when he kissed me, he threw me to him with his poor, weak hands. It was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? not only because it is all sweet to me, it is because you have been, and are, very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide, and you came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. I want you to see now, and with the eyes of a very happy wife, with her duty has led me, so that in your own married life you may too be all happy as I am. My dear, please, almighty God, your life, may it be all it promises, a long day of sunshine, no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be.
but I do hope that you will be always as happy as I, na I am now. Goodbye, my dear. I shall post this at once, and perhaps write you very soon again. I must stop, for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband. You are ever loving, Mina Harker. They're married now. Um, letter from Lucy Westenra to Mina Harker. Whitby, 30th August. My dearest Mina, oceans of love and millions of kisses, and may you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you could be coming home soon enough to stay with us here. The strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It's quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, full of life, and, and, I sleep, and, and I sleep well. You will be glad to know that I have quite given up in walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week, that is, when I once got into it at night. Arthur says that I am getting fat. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides and rowing and tennis and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that. For at first he told me that he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is nonsense. There he is, calling to me. So no more at present. Just from your loving Lucy. Yes, mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on the 28th of September. We once again to turn to Dr. Seward's audio diary on the 20th of August. The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He is now so far quieted that, our sp uh, that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack, he was perpetually violent. Then one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself. I can wait. Now I can wait. And the attendant came to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat, waistcoat and in the padded room, but... The but the suffused look had gone from his face, and his eyes had something of their old pleading, I might say almost cringing softness. It's cringe, bro! <laughs> I was satisfied with his present condition, and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing to see that the patient had humor enough to see their distrust, for coming close to me, he said in a whisper, all while looking furtively at them. They think I could hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing somehow to the feelings, to find myself disassociated even in the mind of this poor madman from the others. But all the same, I do not follow his thought. Might it take it that I have anything in common with him? So that as we are, as it were, to stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him. I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten or a full-grown cat will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now, and I can wait. I can wait. After a while, I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn, and then he began to get uneasy, at length violent, till at last he fell into a paroxysm which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. The cylinder runs out, and then we, and then he clearly has stuck another a new one in. Three nights, the same thing has happened: violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunrise. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there were some influence which came and went. <sighs> what a happy thought! We shall tonight play sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with it. We shall give him a chance and have the men ready to follow in case they are required. If we were able to see the little the little wax cylinder, you could see that he's lifted the lifted the needle and moved it very slightly and put it back down. Twenty third August. The expect the unexpected always happened. How well this really knew life. Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly, so all our subtle arrangements were for naught. At any rate we have proved one thing. The spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in the future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. I have given orders to the night attendant, merely to shut him in the padded room when once he is quiet, 
until an hour before sunrise. The poor soul's body will enjoy the relief, even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Fuck, the unexpected again. I'm called. The patient has once more escaped. Distantly, we hear clanging as the needle comes up off of the cylinder. It drops once more. Later, another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again, he went into the grounds of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and had not the attendants seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then suddenly, just as suddenly, grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, and could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky, except for a big bat which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel, flit about, but this one it seemed to go straight on, as if it knew where it was bound, and had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, You needn't tie me, I shall go quietly. Without trouble. We came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm. I shall not forget this night. The needle once more rolls off the end of the cylinder. Then we will come back to Lucy Westenra's diary. Killingham, 24th August. One moment. Water. No boring. Keep reading. Okay. Uh, telling him, 24th August. We must imitate me now and keep writing things down. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish you were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of the air or getting home again. It is all dark and worried to me, for I can remember nothing, and I am so full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me, and I hadn't the spirit to try to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse and try. 25th of August. Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself. And doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake, and succeeded for a while. When the clock struck twelve, it waked me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, and as I remember no more, I suppose I must then have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I'm horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't seem ever to get air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable to see me so. A letter from Arthur Holmwood to Dr. Sward. Alba Marlow Hotel, 31st August. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favor. Lucy is ill. That is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there is any cause. I do not dare to ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Westenra has confided to me that her doom is spoken, a disease of the heart, though poor Lucy does not know it yet. I am sure that there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I am almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, she finally consented. It will be a painful task. Magnus, speaking of painful tasks, Magnus. There we go, no more dig. Yeah, it's going to be a painful task if you keep digging, because you're going to wear out your beans. All this dry air, rubbing your beans against the floor over and over for no reason, you're going to give yourself cracked beans. 
Then I'm gonna have to get you some kind of like bean ball. And I know you're not gonna wanna hold still for me to put that on your toe beans. I don't know why I lecture him. He clearly does not listen. Which, to be fair, most domestic cats have some grasp of English, but I clearly he does not understand all of what I'm saying. I'm mostly lecturing him for my own benefit, to be fair. Anyway. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, that there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I'm almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I thought I should ask you to see her, and uh, we already did all that. We were stopped on paying for tasks because I made a goof about it. Uh, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask or you to act. You are to come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow, two o'clock, as to not arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Westenra. And after lunch, Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together. I am filled with anxiety and want to consult with you alone as soon as I can, as soon as I can, after you have seen her. Do not fail, Arthur. A telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Seward, 1st September. I am summoned to see my father, who is worse. Stop. I am writing. Stop. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring. Stop. Wire me if necessary. Stop. I am inserting those stops as artistic license. Which you would think, by the way, well, I guess there's not Morse for a period, is there? Like, this stop is more letters, and you pay with a letter with a telegram. Anyway, I am entirely unaware of the full historic implications of whether or not there are stops. Anyway, letter from Dr. Sinward to Arthur Holmwood, 2nd September. My dear old fellow, with regard to Mrs. Wisten with with to, with regard to Miss Westenra's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She's woefully different from la from what she was when I saw her last. Of course, you must bear in mind that I did not have full opportunity of examination such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I had better tell you directly what happened, leaving you to draw and measure your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done and propose doing. I found Miss Westenra in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and in a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt, she guesses, if she does not know what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got, as some kind of reward for our labors, some real cheerfulness amongst us. Then Mrs. Stenra went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and till we got there, her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, hiding her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how, how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once, and settled that matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. So I am quite free. I could easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemic signs, and by a chance I was actually able to test the quality of her blood, for in opening a window which was stiff, the cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly with broken glass. It was a slight matter in itself, but it gave me an evident an evident chance, I secured a few drops of the blood, and have analyzed them. The qualitative analysis gives quite normal condition, and shows, I shall infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters, I was quite satisfied there is no need for anxiety, but as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it is something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing satisfactorily at times, and of heavy, lethargic sleep, with dreams that frighten her, 
regarding which she can remember nothing. She says as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and that when in Whitby the habit came back, and at once she walked out in the night and went to East Cliff, where Miss Murray found her, but assures me that as of late the habit is not returned. I'm in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things were to be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are and your relations to Miss Westenra. This, my dear fellow, is in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason, so no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man, but this is because he knows what he's talking about better than anyone else. He's a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day, and he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of the ice brook, an indomitable resolution, self-command, and toleration exalted from virtues to blessings, and the kindness of the truest heart that beats, these form his equipment for the noble work that he is doing for mankind, both work in theory and in practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I shall see Miss Westenra tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the stores, shall I, so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. Yours always, John Sward. Letter Abraham Van Helsing, M. D. D. E. H. D. Lit. etc. etc. to Dr. Sward. About to do a lot of behind the scenes editing. Preemptive apology for chat spam. Ah, uh, good luck. E. Uh, so we are... Abraham Van Helsing has finally uh, stepped into the story. Let us read his... Uh, Letter to Dr. Seward, 2nd September. My good friend, when I have received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave just at once, without wrong to the uh, to any of those who have trusted me. For fortune, other than it were bad for those who have trusted, uh, for I come to my friend when he calls me, to aid those that he holds dear. Tell your friend that when the time... Uh, that when that time you sucked from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene from that knife that our other friend too nervous let slip, you did more for him than he wants than when he wants my aids, and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. But it is pleasure that added to do him your friend, for it is to you that I come. This is a very difficult style of speech to read. I have completely lost, like, he is, is he just, he's just lauding, he's lauding accolades on Dr. Sward here. I don't quite know what beyond the use, uh, Dr. Sward saved Van Helsing or one of his friends, uh, from gangrene, from someone else misapplying a knife? Questions mark? I think that's what I got out of that. Sorry, it was very... Like, I do not often lose the path of a sentence like that, so I just needed to clarify if that's what I got out of that. Feel free to email me if I'm horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, but it is pleasure added to do for him, your friend. It is to you that I come. Have then rooms for me at the, grand, at the Great Eastern Hotel, so that I may be near to hand, and please so arrange it that we may see the young lady not too late on tomorrow, for it is likely that I may have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if it must. Till then, goodbye, my friend John. Van Helsing. Letter, Dr. Sward, to Honorable Arthur Holmwood. 3rd September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham, 
and found that, by Lucy's discretion, her mother was lunching out, so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me, and I shall advise you, for of course I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but he says he must think. When I told him of our friendship, and how you trust me in the matter, he said, uh, you must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will. Nay, I have not jested. There's no jest, but life and death, perhaps more. Library, can you please watch where you put your beans? Thank you. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when he had, when you, when, this was when we had come back to town. He was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me any further clue. You must not be angry with me, Art, for his very residence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit, just as if I were doing a descriptive special article for the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts in London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report tomorrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit, Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She'd lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for him. I believe Van Helsing saw it, too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy brows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things except ourselves and diseases, and with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense of animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit, and suavely said, My dear young miss, perhaps it is so great pleasure because you are so much beloved. That is, my dear, he ever were there that that which I did not see. They told me that you were down in the spirit, that you were of a ghastly pale. To them I say, Poof! And he snapped his fingers at me and went on. But, how, but you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he, and he pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that which once he pointed me out to his class, or, or rather, after a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of, know anything of young ladies? He has his madams to play with, and, he, and to bring them back to happiness, and to those that love. It is much to do, and oh, but there are rewards in that we can bestow such happiness. But the young ladies, he has no wife nor daughter, and the young do not tell themselves to the young, but to the old, like me, who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. So, my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden, whilst you and I have a little talk all to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about. Presently, the professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave and said, I have made careful examination. There is no functional cause. With you, I agree that there has been much blood loss. It has been, but it is not. But the conditions of her are in no way in need. I have asked her to send me to, to send me her maid, that I may ask just one or two questions, that I, so that I am not chance to miss nothing. I know well what she will say, and yet there is cause. There is always cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send to me the telegram every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease, or not to be all well, is a disease, interests me. And the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charmed me, and for her, if not for your disease, I've got it. As I tell you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep stern watch. I trust your poor father is rallying. It must be a terrible thing to you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are so dear to you, the both of us. I know your idea of duty to your father and your right to stick to it, but if need be, I shall send you word at once to come to Lucy. So do not be over-anxious unless you hear from me. Oh, 
once again out of water, not like this. Uh, how much farther in this chapter do we have? Okay, take note, we are on 258. Oh, that's not far. Eight point something point nine. Ah, there we are. Uh, sorry, I just needed to check how long this chapter was. Uh, we are almost we are almost due for an intermission, and uh, so yeah. Anyway, Doctor Swart's diary. Hear him place the cylinder into the little dictation machine. And needle drops. Fourth September. Zoophagus patient still keeps a more interest in him. He had only one outburst, and that was yesterday at an unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless. The attendant knew the symptoms and at once summoned an aide. Fortunately, the men came at a run and were just in time, for at the stroke of noon, he became so violent. It took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet, and finally st sank into a sort of melancholy in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tells me that his screams, whilst in the paroxysm, were really appalling. I found my hands full when I got to it, attending to some other patients who were frightened by him. Indeed, I can quite understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour of the asylum, and yet as my patient sits in a corner, brooding with a dull, sullen, woebegone look in his face, which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. He lifts the needle for a moment, and then the needle drops again. Later. Another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him, and found him seemingly as happy and contented as he used to be. He was keeping flies and eating them, and was keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door, between the ridges of paddock. When he saw me, he came over and apologized for his bad conduct, and asked me in a very humble, cringing way to be led back to his own room and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to humor him, so he's back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the window sill, and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not now eating them, putting them into a box as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the last few days, for any clue to his thoughts would be of immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two he looked very sad, and said in a sort of far-away voice, as though saying it to, rather to himself than to me, All over, all over, he's deserted me. No hope for me now unless I do it for myself. Then suddenly, turning, me, turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be good for me. The flies? Yes, the flies like it too, and I like the flies. Therefore, I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply and left him as happy a man as, I suppose, any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. The needle once again rises, and then we hear it drop. Midnight. Another change in him. I had been to see Miss Westenra whom I had found much better, and had just returned, and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yell. As his room is on this side of the house, I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights and inky shadows and all the marvellous tints that come on foul clouds, even as on foul water, and to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery in my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disc sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him, an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative power lunatics have, for if within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signaled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window, brushed out the crumbs of sugar, then he took out his fly box and emptied it outside, threw away the box, and shut the window, and crossing over, sat down on his bed. 
All this surprised me, so I asked him, Are you not going to keep flies anymore? No, I'm sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, the cause of his sudden passion. Stop, there may be a clue after all, if we can find why today his paroxysms came on at high noon and at sunset. If it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods which affect certain natures, this as at times the moon does others, we shall see. A telegram from Sward in London to Van Helsing in Amsterdam. 4th September. Patient still better today. A telegram from Sward to Van Helsing. 5th September. Patient greatly improved. Good appetite. Sleeps naturally. Good spirits. Color coming back. A telegram Sward to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 6th September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. I hold over a telegram to Holmwood to have seen you. And before we find out uh, just how badly the patient has deteriorated or just what is causing her deterioration, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of the stream. It's time for an intermission. We will be right back. Uh, sit tight. I shouldn't be long. I am just gonna snag some water and pet my animals and stretch my leggies. Maybe double check a few other things. Uh, I heartily suggest you do the same. If you've been sitting along with me, stand up and stretch your legs. If you've been standing along with me, perhaps find a place to recline for a while. Uh, I don't want you to grow too fatigued. We've got another half of the stream to go, another half of the podcast to go. Either way, give some love to your pets for me. Drink some water, please. Uh, I have yet to find uh, Ram Stoker's favorite words, so we've not been doing that. But uh, definitely remember to drink some water. Maybe take some medications if, if it is uh, an appropriate hour for you to do that. Either way, we will be right back momentarily. The longest it'll be is 15 minutes. Also, I'm working on a uh, on a music solution, so I don't have to jump through quite so many hoops. Uh, I'm actually considering learning a little bit of generative synth and like building a synth patch right before the stream, but that's tentative. Anyway.
wonderful news, everyone. Uh, the, the loaf of bread that I have had rising in the back of the shot, off to the right, you might not actually have been able to see it. Excuse me. Uh, the loaf of bread that I've had rising uh, secretly, off to the right, has completed its uh, rising process. And so, as soon as the stream's over, I'm going to bake that bread. Uh, keep one eye out for that in the Discord. Ooh, wait. Keep one eye out for that in the Discord, if I remember to post it there. Uh, and if I don't, you should be able to see it on Twitter. Ooh, I don't have a command for my Twitter. It's fine. Uh, it's Glacier Nester on Twitter. I'm very easy to find. Basically anywhere that allows underscores, uh, it's it's got an underscore, and if it doesn't allow underscores, it's usually just run all together, because 99 times out of 100, places don't allow spaces. <laughs> Heck, there's a few places, actually, that are, like, not necessarily social media, but, like, you know, games servers, essentially. I managed to get on early enough just to get Glacier, which is huge because that's that's usually taken super super early. Like that's my that's my username on Ingress, for example. That's how that's how early I've been playing that game. Which I really need to open the game again and figure out how those uh, how those drone rules work because purportedly the drone allows you to play remotely a little better which is something I have been begging for literally since the start of the game. Okay. Actually, uh... Ooh. Yeah, Magnus. I disturb you, sir. I think he's more so just miffed that I've closed the windows. He was quite enjoying that breeze. If I, if I start to go red, by the way, uh, you can't really see my ears in this shot, but like if I start to go red, oh, a chew Magnus. If I start to go red, someone yell at me to open a window. <laughs> I mean, more red. I'm already kind of at a base pretty red because I'm in a very sunny place. But you know. Okay. I believe we are ready to dive into chapter ten. We will wait patiently for Magnus to cause his problems. Don't do that. Hey sir. Yeah, you can shake at me all you like. You are not allowed to be digging. I did not give you a digging permit. Young oh, man. And I know you all can't hear it very well, but it, it does distract me in a major fashion. There we go. Just lay down right there. That's a good spot to be. And usually he starts causing problems at the beginning and at the very end of the stream. I, I almost wonder if it is his way of trying to remind me that I should be live. Which, if so, he needs to pick a better way of reminding me. We will likely see more of Library as the stream gets later and later as well. Because he's very insistent on enforcing my Circadia. Which, admittedly, I do appreciate. It's just he doesn't update for the uh, time zones. That I'm in. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, he doesn't update for which time zone I'm in, so sometimes. So he will start, for example, he will start bothering me to go to bed at the usual time in Central Time. I'm in Mountain Time right now. Uh, so that doesn't work out. <laughs> He's bothering me two hours early. Anyway, I, I digress. Let's dive back. I know what I forgot to do. One moment. I'm going to put the BRB back up. I want to leave the mic on. I was going to tweet. Because I forgot to do that. I'm going to tweet that we're halfway through, but now is a good time to show up.
Oh, oh, that was disgusting. Did you all just see the, like, font not render correctly for a second? Sorry to call that out, because it, it was gross. But, like, it didn't have Google fonts for a second? Which was super weird. Sorry, I, I forgot about, uh, I was gonna, but do I have any Dracula gifts? Twilight. Durr. We're just gonna post a very sparkly, we're just gonna post a very sparkly Edward Cullen, if there is one. You know what, sure, yeah, this guy flourishing this baseball bat, sure, I'll allow it. Also, wow, they color graded those those movies so blue. Like maybe it's just because I didn't watch them at the time, because I was busy uh, reading other stuff and being edgy. Uh, but <laughs> they colored those movies so so blue. Like I guess that's a great way to like. That's a great way to color grade a night scene so you can actually see. I got. I I suppose that's what's being implied there is because, you know, the whole cast bar a few people are vampires and so they go out when they go out at night it's all color graded super super dark blue and that's how they're implying that it's not sunny it works we take those it's better than it's actually the middle of the night and you can't see anything and all you can see is the reflection of your big stupid head while you watch the thing sorry can you tell that's a pet peeve of mine Oh, there's a bunch of uh oh that looks fun uh sorry there's a bunch of fun stuff happening on twitter so i need to close that immediately so i do not get distracted by all the cool stuff happening on twitter uh man i've been loving this uh twitter account threatening music notation good good stuff It's just very entertaining to me because it's very silly. It's very silly music notation. Anyway, I need to close Twitter because I am supposed to be streaming, sir. Uh, ooh, you know what I can do before I close Twitter is I can make it so that I have a link to my Twitter uh, on the in my commands. Is that allowed? Can I share my profile? Okay, good. So let me just copy. Now if I can remember how to activate the adding of commands. I believe it's add. Or wait, no, it's command. Uh... Twitter. Let's see if that works. That didn't work. Ooh, I'm also re immediately removing those questions mark. That's not allowed.
Oh, it didn't work because I typed it wrong. I spelled it wrong. Typing. First of all, let's get rid of those little, like, doodle doos. Not a fan of those, thank you. No, I did not want to select the whole thing. Ooh, bud. Sorry, I need to get rid of these little, like, uh, what's the technical term here? Parameters, I believe. Are you gonna are you gonna play nice? Okay, cool. It's not gonna play nice. I'll do it later. This is why we don't try to do things live, kids. Uh where was I? We were about to get into chapter ten of this book. Yes, no, maybe so. Hey, OBS, you good? Sorry, my OBS stopped responding. Hello? Hello? I'm clicking items. Oh, it's rendering the snowflakes. That's why everything's locked up. Uh, sorry, the, the, the snowflakes that you can see in the background are very, very resource intensive for about five seconds, and then they stop exploding. Uh, it, it's just a byproduct of how they're written. Uh, to be honest with you, I could be doing it much less computationally intensively. There is, there is assuredly an easier way to do what I have done on the screen here. And there is assuredly a more efficient and elegant way of doing what I have on the screen here. Did I do it that way? No. I threw the initial code together in 30 minutes and then tried to whack bonk it over the head for an entire month to get it to scroll correctly, and then it wouldn't scroll correctly, and I'm still miffed about it. Anyway. To be honest, the, the, the load of this particular JS file is not something that is high on my list of priorities because it runs once a stream. Twice, maybe. <laughs> it is not often a, a dire inconvenience to me. Could I polish it up? Yes. Will I polish it up before I release it to the public? Also, yes. Anyway, I've digressed for far too long. Let's, uh... Let's head into Chapter 10. A letter from Dr. Seward to Honorable Arthur Holmwood on the 6th of September. My dear Art, my news today is not so good. Lucy this morning had gone back. There is, however, one good thing which has arisen from it. Mrs. Wistenra has was naturally anxious concerning Lucy, and has consulted me professionally about her. I took advantage of the opportunity, and told her that my old master, Van Helsing, the great specialist, was coming to stay with me, and that I would put her in charge, her and his... Ooh. Excuse me. Uh, and that I would, I would put her in his charge conjointly with myself, so we now can come and go without alarming her unduly, for a shock to her would mean sudden death, and this, in Lucy's weak condition, might be disastrous to her as well. We are hedged in with difficulties, all of us, my poor fellow, but please, God, we shall come through them all right. If any need, I shall write, so that if you do not hear from me, take it for granted that I am simply waiting for news. In haste, yours ever, John Sawark. Once again, Mr. Seward drops a needle onto this wax cylinder. 7 September. The first thing Van Helsing said to me when we met at Liverpool Street was, Have you said anything to our young friend in Europa? No. I, I, I had waited till I had seen you, as I said in my telegram. I wrote him a letter, simply telling him that you were coming, as Miss Westenra was not so well, and that I should let him know if need be. Right, my friend. Quite right. Better he not know as yet. Perhaps he will never know. I pray so, but if it be needed, then he shall know all. And my good friend John, let me caution you. You deal with the man, and all men are mad in some way or the other. And inasmuch as you deal discreetly with your madman, so deal with God's madman too, the rest of the world. You tell not your madman what you do, nor why you do it. You tell them not what you think. So you shall keep knowledge in its place where it may rest. 
for it may gather its kind round and breed. You and I shall keep as what we know here and here. He touched me, first on the heart, and then on the forehead, then touched himself the same way. I have myself. I have for myself thoughts of the present. Later I shall unfold to you. But why not now? It may do some good. We may arrive at some decision. He stopped and looked at me and said, My friend John, when the corn is grown, even before it is ripened, while the milk of its mother earth is in him, and the sunshine has not yet begun to point him, with his gold, the husbandman, he pull the ear and rub him between his rough hands, and blow away the green chaff, and say to you, Look, he's good corn, he will make good crop when the time comes. I did not see the application and told him so. For reply, he reached over and took my ear in his hand and pulled it playfully, as he used long ago, as he used long ago to do at, at lectures, and said, the good husbandman will tell you so, because he knows, but not till then. But you do not find the good husbandman dig up his planted corn to see if it grows. That is for the children who play at husband, and not for those who take it as the work of their life. See you now, friend John. I have sown my corn, and nature has her work to do in making it sprout. If he sprouts at all, there is some promise, and I wait till the year begins to swell. He broke off for evidence. Uh, he broke off, for evidently he saw that I understood, and he went on, and very gravely, You are always a careful student, and your casebook was ever more full than the rest. You were the only student then, now you are master. Uh, and I trust that good habit have not failed. But remember, my friend, that, we, that knowledge is stronger than memory, and we should not trust the weak. Even if you have not kept the good practice, let me tell you this case of our dear miss is one that may be mind. I say, may be of such interest to us and others that all the rest may not make him kick the beam, as your people say. Now, take then good note of it. Nothing is too small. I counsel you, put down in record even your doubts and your surmises. Hereafter it may be of interest to see how you, true you guess. We learn from failure, not from success. When I described Lucy's symptoms, the same as before, but infinitely more marked, he looked very grave, but said nothing. He took with him a bag in which there were many instruments, drugs, the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade, as he once called it, in one of, our one of his lectures, the equipment of a professor of the healing craft. When we were shown in, Miss Westenra met us. She was alarmed, but not nearly so much as I expected to find her. Nature, in one of her beneficent moods, has ordained that even death has some antidote to its own terrors. Here, in a case where any shock may prove fatal, matters are so ordered that, from some cause or other, the thing is not personal. Even, even the terrible change in her daughter, to whom she is so attached, does not seem to reach her. It is something like the way Dame Nature gathers round a foreign body an envelope of some insensitive tissue which can protect from evil which would otherwise harm by contact. If this should be an ordered selfishness, then we should pause before we condemn any one for the price of egoism, for there may be deeper root in its causes than we have knowledge of. I used my knowledge of this phase of spiritual pathology, and laid down a rule that she should not be present with Lucy, or think of her illness more than was absolutely required. She assented readily, so readily that I saw again the hand of nature fighting for life. Van Helsing and I were shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chocolate pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out prominently. Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing's face grew set as marble, and his eyebrows converged till they almost touched over his nose. Lucy lay motionless, and did not seem to have strength to speak. So for a while we were all silent. Then Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. The instant we had closed the door, he stepped quickly along the passage to the next door, which was open. Then he pulled me quickly in with him and closed the door. My God, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood to keep the heart's action as it should be. There must be transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? I am younger and stronger, Professor. It must be me. Then get ready at once. I will bring up my bag. I'm prepared. I went downstairs with him, and as we were going there, was a knock at the hall door. 
When we reached the hall, the maid had just opened the door, and Arthur was stepping quickly in. He rushed up to me, saying in an eager whisper, but Jack, I was so anxious I read between, uh, read between the lines of your letter, and have been in agony. The dad was better, so I ran down here to see for myself. Is that, is that, is not that gentleman, Dr. Van Helsing? I'm so thankful to you, sir, for coming. When first the professor's eye had lit upon him, he had been angry at his interruption in such a time. But now, as he took in his stalwart proportions and recognized the strong young manhood which seemed to emanate from him, his eyes gleamed. Without a pause, he said to him gravely, as he held out his hand, Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very, very bad. Nay, my child, do not go like that. For suddenly he grew pale and sat down on a chair, almost faint. You are to help her. You can do more than any that live, and your courage is your best help. What can I do? Tell me, and I shall do it. My life is hers, and I would give the last drop of blood in my body for her. The, prof the professor has a strongly humorous side, and I could tell from old knowledge detect a trace of its origin is in, in his answer. My young lad, I do not ask so much as that, not the last. What shall I do? There was fire in his eyes, and his open nostril quiv quivered with intent. Then Helsing slapped him on the shoulder. Come, you are a man, and it is a man we want. You are better than me, better than my friend John. Arthur looked bewildered. Bewildered, and the professor went on by explaining in a kindly way, the Young miss is bad, very bad. She wants blood, and blood she must have or die. My friend John and I have consulted, and we are about to perform what we call transfusions of blood. The transfer from full veins of one to the empty veins which pine for him. Uh, John was to give his blood, or as he's the more young and strong than me. Here Arthur took my hand and wrung it hard in silence. But now here you are, you are more good than us, old or young, who toil much in the world of thought. Now our nerves are not so calm, and our blood not so bright as yours. Arthur turned to him and said, If you only knew how gladly I would die for you, you'd, you'd understand. He stopped with a sort of choke in his voice. Good, good lad, not so far off you'll be happy that you have done for all you love. Come now and be silent. You shall kiss her once before it is done, but then you must go, and you may you must leave at any at my side. Say no word to Madame. You know how it is with her. There is there must be no shock. Any knowledge of it this would be one. Come along. We went. We all went up to Lucy's room. Arthur, by direction, remained outside. Lucy turned her head and looked at us, but said said nothing. She was not asleep, but simply too weak to make the effort. Her eyes spoke to us. That was all. Van Helsing took some things from his bag and laid them on a little table out of sight. Then he mixed a narcotic, and coming over to the bed, he said cheerily, Now, little miss, here is your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. See, I lift you so that to swallow it is easy. Yes. She had made the effort with success. It astonished me how long the drug took to act. This, in fact, marked the extent of her weakness. The time seemed endless until sleep began to flicker in her eyelids. At last, however, the narcotic began to manifest its potency, and she fell into a deep sleep. When the professor was satisfied, he called Arthur into the room, bade him strip off his coat. Then he added, You may take that one little kiss while I bring over the table. Friend John, help to me. So neither of us looked whilst he bent over. Then Helsing, turning to me, said, He is so young and strong, and of blood so pure, that we need not defibrillate. Then, with swiftness, but with absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, something like as the transfusion went on, something like life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks, and though Arthur's and through Arthur's growing pallor, the joy of his face seemed absolutely to shine. After a bit, I began to grow anxious, for the loss of blood was telling on Arthur, strong man as he was. It gave me an idea of what a terrible strain Lucy's system must have undergone, that what weakened Arthur only partially restored her. But the professor's face was set, and he stood watch. And he stood, watch in hand, with his eyes fixed now on the patient, and now on Arthur. I could hear my own heart beating. Presently he said in a soft voice, Do not stir an instant. It is enough. You attend him. I will look to her. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away. When Van Helsing spoke without turning round, 
The man seems to have eyes in the back of his head. The brave lover, I think, deserves another kiss, which he shall have presently. And as he had now finished his operation, he dusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band, which she seems always to wear around her throat, buckled with an old diamond buckle which her lover had given her, was dragged a little up and showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur did not notice it, but I could hear the deep hiss of indrawn breath, which is one of Van Helsing's ways of betraying emotion. He said nothing at the moment, but turned to me, saying, and now take down our young brave young lover, give him of the poor wine, and let him lie down the wine. He must then go home and rest, sleep much and eat much, that he may be recruited for what he has so given to his dog. He must not stay here. Hold a moment. I take it, sir, that you are anxious of resolve. Then bring it with you in all ways that the officer operation is successful. You have saved her life this time, and you can go home and rest easy in mind that all that can be is. I shall tell her all when she is well. Uh, she shall love you none the less for what you have done. Goodbye. When Arthur had gone, I went back to the room. Lucy was sleeping gently, but her breathing was stronger. I could see the counterpane move as her breast heaved. At the, by the bedside sat, sat Van Helsing, looking at her intently. The velvet band again covered the red mark. I asked the professor in a whisper, uh, What do you make of that mark on her throat? What do you make of it? I have not examined it yet, I answered, and then and there proceeded to loose the band. Just over the external jugular vein there were two punctures, not large, but wholesome looking. So hereabouts, I would say, you know, because the jugular is the vein that you can find the pulse on in someone's neck, right? God. I need to get more exercise, speaking of. I just, like, noticed my pulse. I need I need to get more exercise. That's, that's not as aggressive as it probably should be. Uh, anyway. You know, here-ish. I know everybody's like, oh, down here. Well, I guess you could. Anyway, I digress. I'm not the super aware of anatomy in three dimensions. Uh, there was no sign of disease, but the edges were white and worn looking, of it, as if by some trituration. It had once occurred to me that this wound, or whatever it was, might be the man's that means of that manifest loss of blood, but I abandoned the idea as soon as it formed, for such a thing could not be. The whole bed would have been drenched scarlet with the blood which, which, with the girl, which the girl must have lost to leave such a pallor as she had before the transfusion. Your head? Well, I can... Oh, excuse me. Well, I can make nothing of it. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here all the night, and you must not let her sight pass from her. Shall I have a nurse? We are the best nurses, you and I. You keep watch all night, see that she is well fed and nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all the night. Later we can later on we can sleep, you and I. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we may begin. Uh, may begin? What on earth do you mean? Uh, we shall see, he answered as he hurried out. He came back a moment later and put his head inside the door, said with his warning finger held up, Remember, she is your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not sleep easy hereafter. And the needle runs off the side of the, uh, runs off the side of the wax cylinder. And he inserts another. The needle drops. We hear a little. Dr. Seward's diary. Dr. Suarez's diary continued, 8th September. I sat up all night with Lucy. The opiate worked itself off towards dusk, and she waked naturally. She looked a different being than she had been before the, before the operation. Her spirits, even, were good, and she was full of a happy vivacity, but I could see evidences of the absolute prostration she had undergone. When I told Miss Westenra or Mrs. Stenra, that Dr. Van Helsing had directed that I should sit up with her, she almost poo-pooed the idea, pointing out her daughter's renewed strength and excellent spirits. I was firm, however, and made preparations for my long vigil. When her maid had prepared her for the night, I came in, 
having in the meantime had supper, and took a seat by the bedside. She did not make any objections in any way, but she looked at me gratefully whenever I caught her eye. After a long spell she seemed sinking off to sleep, but with an effort it seemed to pull herself together and shake it off. This was repeated several times, with greater effort and shorter pauses as the time moved on. It was apparent that she did not want to sleep, so I tackled the subject at once. You do not want to go to sleep? No, I'm afraid. Afraid to go to sleep? Why so? Is the boon we all crave for? Oh, not if you were like me. Sleep was to you a presage of horror. A presage of horror? What on earth do you mean? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. That's what's so terrible. All this weakness comes to me in sleep until I dread the very thought. But, my dear girl, you may sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. I can promise that nothing will happen. No, I can trust you. I seized the opportunity and said, I promise you that if I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. You will? Oh, will you really? How good you are to me that I will sleep. And almost at the word, she gave a deep sigh of relief and sank back sleep. All night long I watched by her. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-giving, health-giving sleep. Her lips were slightly parted, and her breast rose and fell with the regularity of a pendulum. There was a smile on her face, and it was evident that no bad dreams had come to disturb her peace of mind. In the early morning her maid came, and I left her in her care, and took myself back home, for I was anxious about many things. I sent a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling them of the excellent result of the operation. My own work with its manifold arrears took me all day to clear off. It was dark when I was able to inquire about my zoophagous patient. The report was good. He had been quite quiet for the past day and night. A telegram came from Van Helsing at Amsterdam whilst I was at dinner, suggesting that I should be at Hillingham tonight, as it might be well to be at hand, and stating that he was leaving by the night mail and would join me early in the morning. 9. September. I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I had hardly had a wink of sleep, and my brain was beginning to feel that numbness which marks cerebral exhaustion. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. When she shook hands with me, she looked sharply in my face and said, No sitting up tonight for you. You're worn out. I'm quite well again. Indeed, I am and if there is to be any sitting up, it is I who will sit up with you. I would not argue the point, but went and had my supper. Lucy came with me, and, enlivened by her charming presence, I made an excellent meal and had a couple of glasses of the more than excellent port. Then Lucy took me upstairs and showed me a room next to her own, where a cosy fire was burning. Now, you must stay here. I shall leave the door open and my door too. You can lie on the sofa for that... For I know that nothing would induce any of you doctors to go to bed whilst there is a patient above the horizon. If I want anything, I shall call out, and you come to me at once. I could not but acquiesce, for, as I was dull and tired, and could not have sat up if I had tried. So, on renewing her promise to call me if she should want anything, I lay on the sofa and forgot all about everything. Lucy was Stemmer's diary. 9th September. I feel so happy tonight. I have been so miserably weak that, that to be able to think and move about is like feeling sunshine after a long spell of east wind after a steel sky. Somehow Arthur feels very, very close to me. I seem to feel his presence warm about me. I suppose it is that sickness and weakness are selfish things and turn our inner eyes and sympathy upon ourselves whilst health and strength give love reign, and in thought and feeling he can wander where he wills. I know where my thoughts are, if Arthur only knew. My dear, my dear, your ears must tingle as you sleep, as mine do waking. Oh, the blissful rest of last night, how I slept with that dear, good Mr. Dr. Seward watching me. And tonight I shall not fear to sleep, since he is close at hand and within call. Thank everybody for being so good to me, thank God. Good night, Arthur. Dr. Sawar's diary. It's again the needle drops on his dictation machine. 10th September. I was conscious of the professor's head on hand on my head and started awake all in a second. That is one of the things we learn in an asylum at any rate. And how is our patient? Well, when I left her, or rather when she left me. 
Come, let us see. And together we went to the room. The blind was down, and I went over to raise it gently, whilst Van Helsing stepped with his soft, cat-like tread over to the bed. As I raised the blind and the morning sunlight filled the room, I heard the professor's low hiss of inspiration, and knowing its rarity, a deadly fear shot through my heart. As I raised, as I passed over, he moved back, and his exclamation of horror, God in evil, needed no enforcement from his agonized face. He raised his hand and pointed to the bed. His iron face was drawn and ashen white. I felt my knees begin to tremble. There on the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Even the lips were white, and the gums seemed to have shrunken back from the teeth, as we sometimes see in a corpse after a prolonged illness. Then Helsing raised his foot to stamp in anger, to the instinct of his life and all the long years of habit stood to him, and he put it down again softly. Quick, bring the brandy. I flew to the dining room and returned with the decanter. He wetted the poor white lips with it, and together we rubbed palm and wrist and heart. He felt her heart, and after a few moments of agonizing suspense said, It is not too late. It beats, though, but feebly. All our work is undone. We must begin again. There's no young Arthur here now. I have to call on you yourself this time, Reverend John. As he spoke, he was dipping into his bag and producing the instruments for transfusion. I took it off my coat and rolled up my shirt sleeve. There was no possibility of an opiate just at present, and no need of one. And so, without a moment's delay, we began the operation. After a time, it did not seem a short time either, the draining away of one's blood, no matter how willingly it be given, is a terrible feeling. Van Helsing held up a warning finger. Do not stir, but I fear that with growing strength she may wake, and that would make danger, so much danger. But I shall precaution that I shall give a hypodermic in injection of morphia. He proceeded then, swiftly and deftly, to carry out his intent. The effect on Lucy was not bad, for the faint seemed to merge suddenly into the narcotic sleep. It was with a feeling of personal pride that I could see a faint tinge of color steal back into the pallid cheeks and lips. No man knows, till he experiences it, what it is to feel his own life blood drawn away into the veins of a woman he loves. The professor watched me critically. That will do. Ready? You took a great you, you took a great deal more than from art. To which he smiled, a sad sort of smile, as he replied. He said, never, if you, her fiancé, you have work, much work to do to fix her, do for her, and to others in the present, will suffice. When we stopped the operation, he attended to Lucy, whilst I applied digital pressure to my own incision. I, I assume they would be applying transfusion from here, right? Like, that's the easiest, like, vein that you could prick from here to apply transfusion uh, unless you're aiming for like a particularly good vein in the wrist I don't know I, I've never like I'm not super up on the mechanics of transfusion in this fashion I'm too used to the modern uh, modern fashion of transfusion where you you know pull the blood from from someone into like a blood bag and you know kind of agitate it so it doesn't coagulate uh in such a fashion and then you know manually transfuse it back into the other person from the bag rather than using the mo the motive pressure like the motive blood pressure essentially to perform a transfusion i'm not super up on that so i'm not sure if if like the incision would be here or here i mean he did roll up his his uh, coat sleeve, so it could be either here or here. I mean, I doubt it's anywhere else, since he only rolled up his coat sleeve. I'm not sure. Uh, my instinct is here, because that feels like an easier vein to get with large Victorian, era, like large 1800s era equipment. Plus then you can like, you know, bind here and slow the blood flow so you can do it correctly. I don't know. I'm not an expert. But that is my my mental image is him applying pressure right here to staunch blood flow so he doesn't start, you know, 
spraying blood everywhere. Anyway, I laid down whilst I waited his leisure to attend to me, but I felt faint and sick. By and by, he bound up my wound, sent me downstairs to get a glass of wine for myself. As I was leaving the room, he came after me and half whispered, I, nothing, can be, nothing must be said of this. If our young lover should turn up unexpected as before, no word to him. It would at once write him and, and jealous him too. There must be not so. When I came back, he looked at me carefully and then said, y You are not much the worse. Go into the room and lie on yourself for rest a while. And have much breakfast. Come here to me. I followed out his orders, for I knew how right and wise they were. I had done my part, and now my next duty was to keep up my strength. I felt very weak, and in the weakness lost something of the amazement at what occurred. I fell asleep on the sofa, however, wondering over and over again how Lucy had made such a retrograde movement, how she could have been drained of so much blood with no sign anywhere to show for it. I think I must have continued my wonder in my dreams, for sleeping and waking, my thoughts always came back to the little punctures in her throat and the ragged, exhausted appearance of their edges, tiny though they were. Lucy slept well into the day, and when she woke she was fairly well and strong, though not nearly so much so as the day before. When Van Helsing had seen her, he went out for a walk leaving me in charge with strict injunctions that I was not to leave her for a moment. I could hear his voice in the hall asking the way to the nearest telegraph office. Lucy chatted with me freely and seemed quite unconscious that anything had happened. I tried to keep her amused and interested. When her mother came up to see her, uh, she did not seem to notice any change whatsoever, but said to me gratefully, We owe you much, Dr. Sward, for all you've done. You really must now not... Now take care not to overwork yourself. You're looking pale yourself. You want a wife to nurse. Look after you a bit, you do. As she spoke, Lucy turned crimson, though it was only momentarily, for her poor, wasted veins could not stand for long such an unwanted drain to the head. The reaction came in excessive pallor as she turned imploring eyes on me. I smiled and nodded, laid my finger on my lips. With a sigh, she sank back amid her pillow. Then Helsing returned in a couple of hours, and presently said to me, Now you go home, and eat much drink enough. Make yourself strong. I stay here tonight, and I shall sit up with you and miss myself. You and I must watch the case, and we must have none other to know. I have grave reasons. No, do not ask them. Think what you will. Do not fear to think even the most not probable. Good night. In the hall, two of the maids came to me and asked if they, or either of them, might sit up with Miss Lucy. They implored me to let them, and when I said it was Dr. Van Helsing's wish that either he or I should sit up, they asked me quite piteously to intercede with the foreign gentleman. I was much touched by their kindness. Perhaps it's because I am weak at present. Perhaps it was on Lucy's account that their devotion was manifested, for over and over again I've seen similar instances of woman's kindness. I got back here in time for a late dinner, went my rounds all well, and set this down whilst waiting for sleep coming and the needle raises off and he'll put it back down here in a moment excuse you I don't believe I authorized any disconnections thank you very much Really? Really? You're gonna do this? Am I gonna have to go talk to my car? Or, no, don't do that. Do not do that. Connect to the... There we go. Connect to the real internet. Ugh. Really? Connect to the internet, please. This is why we can't have nice things. This is why we can't have nice things. Ugh. Alright, 23 seconds. Oh, I love this. Love this for me. Come on, reconnect. I need you to reconnect. Come on. I was in the middle of a sentence. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh, uh, we were about to read the 11th September entry. We got one last sipping of water here. Oh, come on. There is no need to pitch a fit. Well, if it pitches a fit prolonged in, in such a prolonged fashion that uh, it gives up, I will go talk to my car. But we will wait it out. Come on now. You're really going to make me... You really... You're really, really going to make me stop an entire hour early. Okay. I'm going to go talk to my car. One minute. Nope, that's not the one I need. I need technical difficulties. Sorry. One moment. Oh, oh, of course it's back now. I'm gonna go talk to my car to make sure it's not just throwing a fit. But I will leave the microphone on. Hooray. Love this for me. Works for three hours of the stream, but not for the fourth one, huh? That'd be too easy. Of course, now that I've gotten up, it's going to function perfectly. For all the good that comes along with this lifestyle, there are inconveniences besides. Is it done throwing a fit? Alright, if it's going to just continue to throw a fit like this, I'm just going to keep reading. But my sincerest apologies. Uh, but... <laughs> If it's gonna keep throwing a fit like this, I I, I I need to keep reading because we still have we need to finish this chapter at a bare minimum. <laughs> you know, I can't leave off in the middle of the chapter, and I'm very sorry about the internet trouble. Come on. If it's gonna keep throwing a fit, uh, I'm just gonna let it continue to throw a fit. Uh I'm sorry everyone. But uh, we need to finish this chapter. Hopefully it will smooth back out. Okay, uh, if it ever decides to realize that we do in fact have internet, I mean, I have internet. I can actively see chat updating. Ugh. Anyway, 11th September. This afternoon, I went over to Hilling. Uh, yeah, the needle drops on the, uh, dictation device, which is why I'm trying to hold, uh, this guy's character voice, by the way. Dr. Swart's character voice while I'm reading. Uh, 11th September. This afternoon I went over to Hillingham. Found Van Helsing in excellent spirits and Lucy much better. Shortly after I had arrived, a big parcel from abroad came for the professor. He opened it with much impressment. Assumed, of course. And showed a great bundle of white flowers. These are for you, Miss Lucy. But for me? Dr. Van Helsing... Yes, my dear. Yes, my dear, but not for you to play with. These are medicine. Here, Lucy made a wry face. Nay, they are not for you to take it in a decoction or a nauseous form, so you need not snub that so charming nose, or I shall point out to my friend Arthur what woes he may have to endure in seeing so much beauty that he loves so much distort. <laughs> ah, my pretty miss, bring... That brings the so nice nose all straight again. This is medicinal. But you don't know how I put him in your window. Make pretty wreath. I, I make pretty wreath and hang him round your neck. Don't you sleep well? Oh, yes. They, like the lotus flower, make your troubles forgotten. It smells so like the waters of the lathe and that of the fountain of youth that the conquistadores sought 
for in the Florida's and find him all too late. Whilst he was speaking, Lucy had been examining the flowers and smelling them. Now she threw them down, saying with half laughter and half disgust, Oh, Professor, I believe you're only putting a joke on me. Why, oh, these flowers are only common garlic. Okay, the stream has been aggressively dying off and on. Uh, I'm going to stop streaming. God, I, I don't want to stop in the middle of the chapter. How far into the chapter are we? How far would we need to go to reach this? 291.8, 295.8? We're not super far away. Uh, I'm going to muscle through, and uh, we will reach the end of this chapter and then immediately end. Uh, with my sincerest apologies to everyone who's trying to watch. To my surprise, then, Helsing rose up and said with all his sternness, his iron jaw set, and his bushy eyebrows meeting, uh, No trifling with me. I never jest. There is grim purpose in all I do, and I warn you for that you do not thwart me. Take care, for the sake of others, if not for your own. Then, seeing poor Lucy scared, as she might well be, he went on more gently. Oh, little miss, do, my dear, do not fear me. I only do so for your good. But there is much virtue to you in these common flowers. See, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. But hush, no telling to others that they make so inquisitive questions. We must obey, and silence is a part of obedience. And obedience is to bring your strong and well into loving arms that wait for you. Now sit still a while. Come with me, friend John, and you shall help me deck the room with my garlic which is all the way from Harlem, where my friend Vanderpool raised herb in his glass houses all the year. I had to telegraph yesterday or they would not have been here. We went into the room, taking flowers with us. The professor's actions were certainly odd, and not to be found in any pharma pharmacopoeia that I had ever heard of. First he fastened up the windows and latched them securely. Next, taking a handful of the flowers, he rubbed them all over the sashes, as though to ensure that every whiff of air that might get in would be laden with a garlic smell. Then, with the wisp, he rubbed all over the jam of, each, of the door, above and below and each, at each side, round the fireplace in the same way. It all seemed grotesque to me, and presently I said, Oh, Professor, I know that you always have a reason for what you do, but this certainly puzzles me. Uh, well, we have no septic here, or he would say that you were working some spell to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am, he answered quietly, as he began to make the wreath which Lucy was to wear around her neck. We then waited whilst Lucy made her toilet for the night. When she was in bed, he came and himself fixed the wreath of garlic round her neck. The last words he said to her were, Take care you do not disturb it, and even if the room feel close, do not tonight open the window or the door. I promise, and thank you both a thousand times for all your kindness to me. Oh, what have I done to be blessed with such friends? As we left the house in my fly, which was waiting, Van Helsing said, The night I can sleep in peace, and sleep I want. Two nights of travel, much reading in the day between, and much anxiety on the day to follow, and a night to sit up without to wake. Tomorrow in the morning early you called for me, and we come together to see our pretty miss. So much more strong for my spell which I have left. <laughs> he seemed so confident that I, remembering my own confidence two nights before, and with the baneful result, felt awe and vague terror. It must have been my weakness that made me hesitate to tell it to my friend, but I felt it all the more, like unshed tears. Unfortunately, folks, uh, we are going to need to call it there about a half hour early, thanks to technical difficulties, as Raz has so astutely pointed out. Uh, thank you, my darling. Uh, we're going to have to call it a night here. This has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't stay. Thank mm -hmm. you.